everybody. I am so excited to be here. This is my first time at an American Atheist uh, conference. Actually, I just started with American Atheists back in January, so it's my third month on the job. Um, and it's incredible. My background has always been in LGBT uh, law and policy and advocacy. I've worked at organizations like the Human Rights Campaign, so very large organizations, but in a slightly different field. So it's a little bit of a shift, and, um, and I love it so far. It's just amazing. You're all amazing. It's been a wonderful experience. I knew there'd be a little bit of hazing at this new first conference. Um, I didn't expect that I'd be placed at the end of a day filled with amazing speakers, like, like well, of course, with after Hugh Laurie, <laughs> after Jim, after Nick, after Mindy, so just amazing people. And so I, I hope I can add to that. Um, and thank you all for being here. So uh, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, first, um, the American Atheist Legal Center. Who's heard, who knows that we do legal work, first of all? Okay, okay, about half the room, that's great. So in our, America, in our legal center based in Washington, D.C., we really do three different things. We work with partners, so we partner with other national organizations at the national level to really focus and work together in coalition and make sure we're coordinating our movement's activities, our organization's activities with other people. We uh, advocate at both the federal and state level for, for a variety of things, which I'll talk about. And also, we take complaints. So when you see uh, violations of separation of church and state in your communities, when you have complaints and face discrimination in schools or in other places, when someone's fired from their job for being an atheist, you can make a complaint to us and we will represent you. We will look into it, we'll investigate, and if we can, we might even engage in litigation for, on your behalf. So these are things that we, we do and we hope you'll bring complaints to us when those things happen, because that's how we make change. All right, so I'd like to talk about three things today. First, um, actually, am I shifting this or are you? <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Uh, why are we seeing this wave of negative policy changes across the country, first? Second, how separation of religion and government is under attack currently? And third, what are we doing about it as a community and as an organization? All right. So uh, this quote is actually from William Buckley of talking about conservatism, but I love this quote because it really plays into our situation too, talking about con Christian conservatives. And I'll, I'll explain that more in a bit, but really, and trying to stop the flow and progress of history by just wishing it hard enough. And it's magical thinking, it's not really possible, but that seems to be the way that they are going. Um, my hypothesis is what they're trying to do and what I see out there is that Christianity, as several people have already said, is dying, it's under attack. There's, well, it's not under attack, but it's dying. Numbers are dropping off. There are, over the long term, we know demographics are decreasing, the culture is against them. American people don't support things like uh, prohibiting abortion or not teaching such as sex education in schools <laughs> or discrimination. Over the long term, they will lose. They are losing. And uh, some Christians, because of that, feel like they are under attack, right? They feel that sort of losing over time, the loss of religious privilege as discrimination, and therefore they're doing everything possible to delay or deny, deny this change. And I'm gonna just back this up with some, some uh, statistics here to show you what I mean. First, you've already seen these like three times, so I'm not gonna like go into them, but yes, Christianity is declining, we are rising, it's fantastic. And over the long term, we will, uh, you know, we're already the largest no the voting bloc, the, non the nuns are already the largest voting bloc, so over time, you know, that will just continue to grow. But you can see the difference in decline in church membership and the decline in membership and religiosity. And the di major difference, the driver, is among the young. We know that the number of members of Generation Z uh, about 13% identify as atheists compared to about 7% of millennials and even less than that for older people. So we're just a huge number of increase of people identifying as atheists, especially among, especially among the young. So okay, those numbers are, are, are good for us. Is Christianity under attack then? Right? Is it under attack? Well, I'll show you some stats and you can tell me. Whoops, that's not supposed to happen. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, this is the incidence of hate crimes based on religion from the FBI from 2016. Okay, you can see atheists, agnostics at the top. Good news, we don't suffer very many hate crimes. Great. Uh, you can see Christians below that. And you can see the two groups that probably actually are under attack. Muslims about 25% of hate crimes. 
uh, face Muslims, and about over 50% are against Jewish people. Um, do you, does anyone know the, uh, the percentage of Jewish people in the country, the percentage population? It's 2%. 2%, and Muslims is 1%. Right? So we actually, there, there might be some religious groups that face real discrimination here in this country. They are not Christians. <laughs> they are not Christians. So, but despite this, despite this, if you ask them, evangelicals perceive more, perceive more discrimination against them themselves than against Muslims. The one group that says that they face more discrimination than Muslims are white evangelical Protestants. The one group. So they definitely are feeling under attack. It's probably not valid, but that's what they are feeling. And about 70% of white evangelical Protestants say that um, Christians, uh, discrimination against Christians is as big a problem as discrimination against other groups. 70% think it's as big a problem as against other groups, like discrimination against race, against religion, against disability, all these other things. They think that this is as big or a bigger problem, right? And I think this is due to the loss of religious privilege. Um, and they feel that as discrimination. But in order to fight this, this sort of discrimination that they're feeling, this loss of power, this loss of privilege, loss of respect for their opinions at all times and sort of dominating society, they are doing grave harm to the separation of church and state. They're uh, really hurting our constitutional rights and our, uh, the religious liberties that we all hold dear. And that's why we should care as they do everything to cling on to power and maintain it and maintain the slim minority that they have over time, you know, they can really do irreparable harm to the separation of church and, and state in the country. And they can, uh, over time, you know, do things that will really cause a lot of people to suffer, including LGBT people, including atheists and non-believers, my, religious minorities, and, and uh, uh, children, as I'll talk about, and a lot of other people in the meantime while trying to cling on to this, this um, power and privilege that they can't possibly do over the long run. And so let's talk about first why the separation of or religion and government is important. Because I don't think we talk about this not as, enough as a society, really. Maybe we do in this conference. I don't know. It's my first time, like I said. But as a society, we really don't understand why it's important. And I think that's part of the pro reason it's so hard for us to defend it. So this really, uh, the First Amendment really emerges, uh, and I'll read it, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, right? Um, this is really rooted in our history. So people, you know, came over to this country from Europe where there were state churches, right? There were state churches all across Europe. Uh, religious dissidents came to America to escape taxation from churches, to escape persecution, came to America. Unfortunately, then they then set up their own, you know, churches here, state churches, and started to oppress other people that came to America and sort of replicate the cycle. And then those people that were being persecuted there sort of went to other colonies and established them and set up their own state churches and oppressed people. And so you can see the pattern here. Um, and by the time we got to the time of the revolution and drafting of the Constitution, uh, some very smart lawmakers uh, and the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison especially, we're saying, you know, maybe we should just put a stop to this. This is not a good plan. We should stop this. Keep religion and government away from each other. Create a, a wall between them so that government can exist on its own and religion can prosper on its own. And so that's what we have today. And it's worked remarkably well. It's redu reduced religious strife across the country. It helps ensure that everyone is a full citizen regardless of their beliefs in this country. And as they recognized, you know, taxing someone to pay for another's beliefs is tyranny. It is inherently tyranny. And our founding fathers recognized that. They recognized that and really stood, uh, stood against it. Um, one of my favorite quotes is actually from Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, who was, of course, a Supreme Court Justice uh, for, for many years. And she, her, her quote was, um, why should we exchange a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly when it comes to <laughs> church-state separation? Just the importance of it. It's, it's allowed us to prosper in a way that Europe has not prospered and other countries have not prospered. Okay. But, unfortunately, it's under attack. That's the reality. It's under attack in a variety of different ways. I'm just going to talk about a few. 
The first is a string, really, a decade or more of really uh, challenging, and I would say probably not correct, Supreme Court decisions. Uh, under this current administration, it's even more under attack. We see uh, a huge amount of court stacking, appointing justices to the courts that are very detrimental. And I'll talk about some things that are happening with the federal and state government as well. So just a few cases so you can have a clear idea of what's happening. This, a few, this was in 2007, um, and I won't go into detail, but uh, there's something called standing, which is basically your ability to access the courts. So if something bad happens and you feel like something, like there should not be a monument there, it violates uh, you know, separation of church and state, or something like that, um, standing is what it, the ability for you to go to the court, make a complaint, and get it resolved. And so that has been under attack by, by judges, and this is a Supreme Court case, uh, Hind v. FRF, um, was in 2007. It really narrows standing, so it's more difficult for us to get into the courthouse in the first place in order to justify our you know, First Amendment rights. And if you can't get into the courthouse, if you can't get into court to, uh, to uh, vindicate your rights, then those rights don't exist. Right? If, you, if, if they're not worth the paper they're printed on, if you can't actually sue and really get them resolved. And so limitations on standing are really important, and it's one area we're pushing back on. Another, um, has anyone heard of Hobby Lobby, maybe? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, that's good, a few people. Um, it is a, uh, an amazingly, um, well, terrible decision that allows a closely held corporation, so not an individual, but a corporation to bring a religious claim. And, it, you know, it's really, the reason that I think we're most concerned about it is that it's part of a larger campaign to allow religious exemptions to justify discrimination. That's what it is. So it itself is about the um, RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the, fe at the national level. And the idea is over time, the uh, conservative Christians have been using RIFRAs and other sort similar types of laws to undermine non-discrimination policies because they would like the ability to freely discriminate based on their religion. Um, they are not there yet, fortunately, and we are fighting like hell against it. But that is one step again in the right direction for them, unfortunately. Uh, Trinity, Luther, Trinity Lutheran Church. Has anyone heard of Trinity? A few people. This is probably the most disastrous church-state separation decision that has ever existed. Um, it's terrible. And what it says, it sort of reverses the presumption in church-state separation. Instead of saying, okay, well, separation of church and state should be separate, it, it basically turns that on its head and says, you may not discriminate against a religious um, group when you're giving out government money just because they're religious. You have to treat them equally uh, as long as they're doing something secular, or they say they're doing something secular, right? As long as they say they're doing something secular. Um, and so you can see the problem there. If you're not allowed to uh, distinguish between giving out, when you're giving out government money from religious groups and non-religious groups, then it's very, very hard to police them. Most states have a clause in their constitution that prohibits them from giving out money to religious groups. And so that becomes a real problem uh, for the states when they're trying to give out grants and loans. So this is going to be of repercussions for years, and we haven't even begun to see the tip of the iceberg yet, but it's a very significant change. And coming up this year, I hope everyone's excited, is Masterpiece Cake Shop, right? Which is really about the First Amendment. It's not about RIFRA, but it's about the First Amendment and um, a, a cake artists. <coughs> they might have actually heard of a cake artist yeah, well, and apparently that's what bakers are called when you're trying to sue the sue under the First <laughs> Amendment. And basically, it's a um, it's a case it's a case about being able to discriminate based on First Amendment justification. But we're expecting a decision on that this summer. Um, okay, so you can see the pace of these bad cases is increasing. 2007, 2014, 2017. So unfortunately, it is increasing. And one of the reasons for that is because there has been a concerted effort by the opponent opposition to really pack the courts full of as many conservative justices as they possibly can. Uh, just in his first year, and what month is it? Three months of office, the uh, Trump administration has uh, appointed 29 judges. Um, there are 130 30 vacancies currently on, the, Supreme, on the, uh, the various courts around the country, and 32 announced vacancies before the end of Trump's administration, which means basically, before the end, the end of Trump's first administration, assuming he has one four-year term, uh, he has the opportunity to turn over 25% of the federal judiciary. 25%. And you can guess what kind of judges these are, right? They're all they're Christian conservative, they're anti-LGBT, 
their anti-plaintiffs in general, very hard to, to get a fair hearing. They, they don't believe in standing, taxpayer standing. They are religious conservatives in every way. So if it really does taint like the entire process of seeking justice, and it will for years to come, years to come. So it's an area we are fighting back very hard. Um, another area is Attorney General Sessions issued a memo. Now this is not law, but he issued guidance talking about how um, they want the Department of Justice to interpret existing law and to pursue their cases. Now this is, um, it, it's important to understand that his positions that are staked out in this are far beyond what the courts have gone. He's really, it's more of an advocacy agenda. He's really pushing things that have not really been passed through the courts, or maybe there's one off decision somewhere else. But it's not something that they typically do is elevate those and say, this is our position as a government. But the really scary thing is that he has gone to, he's issued a directive that every single US attorney's office across the country has to have a religious freedom monitor, which I'm calling the religious freedom czar, <laughs> in their office that directly reports to high levels of DOJ and is sort of a monitor on religious freedom issues. So whenever something comes up that DOJ feels like they, you know, might involve religious freedom, they have to immediately tell, D you know, the head of DOJ so that they can interfere. They can't bring cases without running them by the head of DOJ, these conservative Christian agenda. That is totally, you're using this sort of analysis to dominate the direction of the Department of Justice. And, you know, what's, what exactly is the separation between that and theocracy? Yeah, and there is not. So it's like if you have to run every single position that your government enforcement agencies take before uh, these appointed officials, it's, it's really challenging. So this is, this is a major area um, that's really significant. Um, now, this is not law, but what they're doing is working in courts to get as many of these points. And let me just give you two of them, for example. Uh, requiring employers to provide insurance coverage for contraceptives automatically burdens their free practice of religion. Um, and allowing religious employers to discriminate against conduct or people inconsistent with their beliefs. So these are just two ideas that that should be allowed um, under the memo that was established. So uh, just to give you a couple ideas of the sort of things that they're pushing in the courts. They've also reversed long-held positions. For example, the position on, um, oh, hold on a second, I might have already talked about it. No, position on LGBT issues, for example. They've been well-established positions on LGBT issues in the courts. and. Under this administration, they've sort of reversed their tack and taken a negative position. Um, one area that, uh, actually this happened, I think, the day after I started. <laughs> so it was quite a thing to jump into. Um, disaster recovery. So FEMA, Federal Education Management Association, uh, provides disaster relief funds after there is a major disaster, like a hurricane, earthquake, fire, flood, that sort of thing. And for forever, Churches have been eligible to receive loans, just like homeowners and everybody else are able to. So they, if the church burns down, they can get a loan from the federal government, very low interest, and they'll rebuild the church. Um, so they, this memo policy change, what it says is they are now eligible for government grants as if they were essential government services. So they are now eligible. So, so let's say there's, you know, they are now competing with government funding for, you know, after a disaster with municipalities with schools, with community centers, with all these other groups that are actually need the disaster recovery fund to rebuild their, their damaged town and lives and the town hall and the hospitals and you know those sorts of things. So at the same time, they're saying, well, let's give, let's give a portion to churches. That seems like a good idea. And not only was that passed by FEMA, it was also uh, passed by Congress. That is now the law. It is passed by Congress. Of course, we are looking into challenging that as well. That's an issue that we will need to bring litigation on and that we're currently looking into. But I have to ask you if, you know, if the First Amendment, and the, the Establishment Clause, does not stop the federal government from taxing you to give money to build a church, what does it do? So, I mean, it's the very core of the First Amendment, it's the very core of the Establishment Clause to be able to not have the federal government give money to build churches. This is why this is so important, and this is what's at stake currently. We're also seeing just recently, uh, there was some uh, administrative comments and changes about religious refusals in healthcare. So they created a new conscience and Rel religious freedom division as part of the Office of Civil Rights at the Health, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. 
So let me tell you, for the past 10 years, there's been one complaint each year that a provider, well, an average, an average one complaint each year that a provider has had not had their uh, religious rights under the law respected. Like, for example, they don't want to perform an abortion. The hospital says you have to, and they file a complaint. That's happened one time, one time per year, average. Um, and so because of that, they decided to create a new office and allocate $200 million to it. Um, $200 million, which is amazing. And this new office is not dedicated towards stopping discrimination in healthcare, like every other service of the Office of Civil Rights, right? It's not trying to protect patients from discrimination when they go to the doctor. The doctor won't see you because you're gay. The doctor, you know, won't see you um, because because they don't like they don't like you or they don't like your religion, something like that. It's not about that. It's making sure that providers have the ability to discriminate based on their religion. That is the goal. They want to be able to make sure that they can discriminate based on their religion and not provide various different services based on their religion. Um, yeah, so this is a major reversal. Uh, it's something that we just, you might have even seen, we sent out action alerts, I think, to all our members asking you to please take action on this one because it's so important. Um, and so I just want to mention a couple other things. I'm not going to go into detail on these because there's just too many. The First Amendment Defense Act, which will allow discrimination based on, against LGBT people if it passes. Repeal of the Johnson Amendment. Educational vouchers, so diverting federal and state funds into voucher programs, which 95, or I think it's 90 or 95 percent, go to religious schools. Sex education funding being spla sl slashed for abstinence only funding. Uh, amending religious nonprofit rules so they can give more government funding to the religious nonprofits. These are all things happening at the federal level. So let's look at the state. Okay, so over the past, I think things about 200, uh, 2015, we've just seen this avalanche of negative uh, legislation by conservative groups. Most of it has been originally, originally focused against LGBT people and bills. And this, a lot of this was around the Obergefell ruling, which is about same-sex marriage. So it, the ruling was expected to come down. We saw this huge amount, 125 bills all across the country. The following year after it passed, we saw about 250 anti-LGBT bills. And the majority of these did not pass. But as part of this, we saw a new emerging strategy over time that they would want to be able to use religion to discriminate. And uh, a number of those, a few of those bills did pass, I'll tell you about that. But you see, over time, they sort of shifted their position from being about, okay, we get to discriminate against LGBT people to we get to discriminate based on our religion. And it's been a greater focus on education, youth, and schools over, over the period. In 2017, we saw fewer bills, but they were much more focused and nuanced. And a couple of them, let me just read them for you. Mississippi passed the Protecting Freedom of Conscience from Government Discrimination Act, which enables almost any individual or organization to discriminate against LGBT people in Mississippi at work, at school, in their communities. It was actually uh, challenged in court, but the Fifth Circuit let it go through. Virginia, uh, this was actually vetoed, so that's good news. But a taxpayer-funded organizations like homeless shelters and adoption agencies are able to refuse services to same-sex couples, trans people, and anyone suspected of having intimate partner, intimate partner relationships outside of a heterosexual marriage without the risk of losing taxpayer funding, contacts, or uh, anything else. They could not be punished for it. So they're allowed to freely discriminate with taxpayer funding. Fortunately, it was vetoed, but in other states it would not be. Texas passed a law allowing nurses to refuse to work with a patient if the patient's goals, outcomes, or behaviors purportedly conflicted with their sincerely held principles of the nurse. Kentucky passed a bill undermining uh, anti-discrimination policies on colleges. So if a college says no student organization on this college can discriminate, uh, Kentucky and a lot of pu public universities say that, Kentucky uh, basically eliminated that and said you're not allowed to do that. You have to let religious groups discriminate. Um, so that's what's ha some of the bad things happening in the states. This year, I'm sort of calling this approach to religious freedom, weaponized religious freedom. Um, that it's not really about religious freedom, it's about turning it into the right to discriminate based on religion. That's not religious freedom, it's uh, something else entirely. Um, but a number of things we've seen this year, I've really seen three different trends. An increase in the number of bills regarding religious displays, especially in schools. So a lot of you are probably from states where that is the law, like Arkansas, 
or states where they are proposing it and passing into law, like Florida and Oklahoma. Uh, we have a bill here in Oklahoma. It's SB 1018, which would do that, which will, would require schools to put In God We Trust signs um, in every school class as long as they're donated. The other type of bill we're seeing a lot of are bills that have religious exemptions built into foster care and adoption. And so basically, uh, adoption placement agency, um, they get money from the state and place children with, with loving homes, and they were freely allowed to discriminate based on whatever they you know, feel like discriminating against. They don't like atheists, that's fine. They don't want to place with single people, that's cool. Um, they, they don't like Democrats, great. They, they, you know, they don't like LGBT people, they can do that. So you see, um, that's basically what their, the trend is. And there's one of those in Oklahoma too. It's SB 1140. So I really want to thank uh, Oklahoma for providing such good examples. Because <laughs> we can, don't have to go anywhere. We have to use other states. We can use these right here. Um, and there's also several bills about free speech and higher education. So these are bills, you know, uh, they're sort of justifying them saying, oh, we're shouting down speakers on colleges. But instead, they're really restricting the ability of people to hold protests on colleges and calling it free speech. Or they are eliminating the people's ability to have non-discrimination policies in colleges and calling that free speech. So it's sort of an inverse of actual free speech. And, and there are a number of other types of negative bills. I'm not going to go through these. Um, but these are just some of the ones in other states that we're seeing um, around religious exemptions. So this is not even getting into all the negative bills that we look at regarding, for example, abortion, sex education, LGBT issues, uh, and all the other issues that we, that we care about. So I just want to clarify, there's a lot happening around the country in terms of negative legislation. And all of this, is, I think, is part of the backlash that I spoke about originally. And finally, I just want to show you some of the state maps of what the current law looks like. Uh, these are the states that have RIFRAs, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So these are the laws. OK, thank you. These are the laws that they want to use to be allow people to discriminate against LGBT people and others in states. So you see uh, the stars, or in case you're curious, are the states that already have non-discrimination laws in place. So those are about, if we're about going to see litigation emerge, hitting non-discrimination laws against, against Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, they would emerge in those states. And these are the states that, um, okay, these are the states that already have the discriminatory religious exceptions that I spoke about earlier. So the ones about foster care, for example, uh, that have already been passed into law. And one thing that we're hoping to do this year is basically do a real assessment of the entire country and look at all the laws on the books that affects church-state separation so that we can give you an idea of what it is in actually in your state, what the law looks like both positively and negatively, so that we, can we can't really adjust the law or change it or really until we actually know what's there. So that's one of the major projects that we're working on this year. Okay, well that was, come on, okay. That was depressing, huh? Um, <laughs> that was depressing, okay. Well, I have some good news. <laughs> we are fighting back. We are fighting back. <laughs> Thanks to your help, your membership, your donations, your support, your advocacy, um, and we've just been able to fight back to an amazing degree. I just began with American Atheists, like I said, three months ago. And since that time, we've already moved forward with a number of key programs. First of all, we are shifting our focus in advocacy to state level work. Uh, if you look at the federal level, now is not the right time to do federal level work, right? It's not the right time. There will be a time, this is not it. So uh, we are of course still keeping aware at the federal level, we're still working hard with our partners, but this is the time where we can actually make cutting edge progress in the states. The states are where uh, we can experiment, we can innovate, we can block these negative bills, we can develop new legislation that will actually advance our cause in the states and move forward with it and not just play defense all the time, right? We have to move forward and advance, uh, you, you know, we're not going to win by fighting a purely defensive battle here. We need to go forward and propose new sorts of bills and pass them. And let me just give you a couple examples. We're working in Washington state and Idaho to get rid of provisions that are already in the law that allow parents to sort of neglect children by not offering them real medical care as long as they offer faith healing. So that as, if a child dies and they offer faith healing, no one is liable. It actively allows religion to kill children. 
through these laws. And, it, and these are in states like uh, Washington and Idaho. And the good news is we can stop these. Last year, we moved forward with a bill in Washington, and we uh, got it passed to bipartisan support out of a committee. We almost passed it entirely. Given a little bit more time, I believe this year we can absolutely pass it to remove from the law specific provisions allowing uh, religion to kill children through neglect, uh, which I think is amazing. <laughs> Similarly, we are working to support bills that will prohibit conversion therapy. Does anyone know what conversion therapy is? Yes. It's, okay, great. Conversion therapy is, well, I think it is like basically a psychological abuse of children, but it is trying to convince LGBT young people that they are in fact straight, either through psychological maltreatment or through other means like actual torture or other means. So basically it has incredibly negative effects on young people. It can lead to uh, rending apart families. It can lead to suicide. And you know, these types of bills are actually gaining a lot of traction and passing all across the country. And we are helping that. I believe we've already written testimony and testified in these sorts of bills in I think about six states, including uh, Sam, who is our amazing volunteer. She, she went in person and testified against this in Maryland on two different occasions. So I, I really think we can get these bills passed in at least two, if not three states these, this year, which is amazing progress. And so we're actively switching to support more so state and local work. We're building tools and resources. We're engaging advocates. We're forging coalitions, building resources. But this work really does depend on you to move forward. It's, we're, we want to empower you to engage in advocacy through the programs Jim was talking about, the ACEs, the advocacy component, uh, and just to be a resource to you. Uh, and I'll show you some of the tools that we've developed to do that. The first is our state legislation tracker. So this is now available on our website. We've been working on it for the past several weeks. And what it does is it looks at legislation, both positive and negative, all across the country that affects our issues. So you can see where the most bills are being considered, the dark red ones like Oklahoma. So go Oklahoma. Uh, and I'll show you what a few of those bills look like. If you click on a state, you see things like the subject, the name of the bill. Uh, you can click on it to read the actual bill, read, the law, read about the lawmaker introduced it. You can see our position on the bill, uh, strong oppose, strong support, and the type of bill it is, if it's about education or religious exceptions or, or what it's about. This is free and available on our website, and I encourage you to check it out and review what's happening in your own states on our issues um, at any time. And you, this is kept up to date as bills uh, merge and progress. And when you see a bill that's a problem and you want to take action on it, we have another system. Whoops, I did it again. Uh, folks, <laughs> sorry. Yes, thank you. Okay, our new action alert system. So we have a new action center, and it allows people to sign in and engage in actions directly. So when you sign in, uh, we have set up an action, for example, for you to take this weekend regarding the First Amendment Defense Act, which is a federal level bill that allows people to discriminate against LGBT people, and two bills here in Oklahoma. One about religious displays in schools, and the other about discrimination on the basis of religion in foster care and adoption. So by, by clicking in and sending a letter, it's already written for you. You send a letter directly to your lawmakers uh, in your house or at the federal level about these bills. Nothing could be easier. So you just really have to press a button and, and share it, and share it on social media. And by that way, they're hearing from us, they're hearing from our community, and they know what our stances are. Um, and so that's one another way that we're hoping to take action. And by the way, if you see bills in your area and you want to put, uh, put them in the system, all you have to do is email me. I will add bills in the system. If something's happening in Iowa and there's going to be a hearing and we need to add a bill, we can easily do that. We can mail it out to our constituents. We can mail it out to our affiliates for you to mail out to other people. This is something that's available as a resource for everyone to work on and advocacy locally. Uh, and finally, I want to note that we um, engage in constituent complaints. We, I mentioned this at the beginning. We take complaints and provide legal help around the country. Uh, you're going to hear tonight a, um, about some of the work we do with a uh, wonderful young woman, Mari, in, in Texas, who every day is facing discrimination in schools and fighting back. And I'm just really proud that we have the opportunity to support her as an organization and really stand up against discrimination against atheists in schools. I mean, that's what we need to be doing. Um, 
And so we, we take complaints across the country and we will work on them with you and if resolve them if possible and engage in litigation if we can't resolve them through other methods. Uh, all these services are available on our website. And the truth is, just this, this is just the beginning. We're hoping to uh, engage more in this program. Most of these services, uh, except for the constituent services and the litigation, of course, are about three months old. And so we're still building. We want to be able to build, build, do the landscape survey. We want to be able to um, work on more cases. We want to be able to engage in more states, to create more resources, to testify before more bills, to, to develop and introduce new legislation to advance our cause. These are all things that we need your support and help to do. Um, we thank you for everything you've done, every donations you made, but it's, we ask you please, please to upgrade your membership to support this work with donation. This is the work that we need to be doing in order to move us forward, and this is the time to do it. Um, there are ways to donate directly on our website. There are also ways to become a monthly contributor or to upgrade your membership or even to make one-time donations. Also getting involved with local programs. So Jim mentioned the ACES program. It's a great way for you to get involved because we need both resources financially and the, uh, the advocacy tools and the power, people power to succeed. We need you to engage in these things and contact us when we can support you with these tools. Um, and so I don't know if I have, I think I have a mi minute just for two questions, but I want to thank you all and see if we have any questions. Everyone in this room can appreciate uh, the initialism LGBT and how potent that is from a political standpoint and a legal standpoint. Yeah. And I, so my first question is, uh, how potent is LGBT or LGBTQ from a legal standpoint? How much power or potency does that give in litigation, for example? Well, there are several different LGBT groups um, that engage in litigation. There are fairly, fairly large ones like Land Legal, of course, ACLU. And we do partner with those groups. Um, our issues are a little bit separate. I mean, if a, if a group is focusing on LGBT discrimination, we'd probably let those experts handle it rather than focusing on, on our search hate separation issues, which is really our focus. So it's a, it's a little bit different in that way. Uh, I'm not quite sure. That yeah, I guess what I'm asking, how useful is that uh, initialism itself, just in ter terms of uh, church and state separation issues that you litigate? Just, in other words, instead of saying it gay, we say LGBT, yes. right? Which is well, we say that because it's a broader community. It really integrates a whole range of people, and it's an identity in a community that's well-known and identified, uh, which is, has a lot of political power behind it, because over years, they've sort of you know, made themselves a political force, engaged in litigation and advocacy, and it's not dissimilar from us. We're still building that recognition, and we, a few people have talked about the importance of voting, but that's how you get there. That's how you get that name recognition. Yes, I agree. I agree 100% with everything you just said. And in that spirit, um, I've been thinking about an acronym that we that might help us achieve the kind of status and political and legal potency. Well, let's and, talk and about it. Um, okay. I just just briefly, it's uh, A F A H, um, atheists, free thinkers, agnostics, and humanists. So, I'm not sure how LGBT became a household initialism, but if we had something like that, it it helps. Uh, provide cohesiveness and might provide us a little more power. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Uh, my question is, how do you think we can fight all those laws if sometimes it isn't about arguments, yeah. but I don't know what it is, and I'm thinking uh, about uh, Trinitar Trinity Lutheran Church uh, versus Summer 2017, in which one the Supreme Court they didn't run the facts, I don't know, again, Everton versus Board of Education or the lemon test, for mm -hmm, example, mm -hmm, those are mm -hmm. a pretty strong. So you're asking about how we litigate against the Trinity, yeah. and yeah, that, that's a complex the answer. The isn't any more about arguments and using the tools that we have to keep the separation. Well, it is somewhat about arguments, because I think Trinity, it says something, the, the decision itself has a, some indication that it's just about playgrounds and the minor aspect. And so it's our job as attorneys and litigators for this movement to make sure it actually keeps that narrow. As we define it and as we bring cases to sort of narrow it, we try to keep it to those parameters and help prevent the opposition from expanding and saying it applies to all government funding to everywhere. And so that's, one of the, that's our strategy. We're working with other partner organizations to bring those cases to limit it so that it only applies in very, very narrow circumstances to only secular things and not to all government funding for all purposes. 
and I think we are done. So thank you all so much.